are these people? We got James Bond, Daniel Craig. He's there in Palestine with his Aston Martin um, back there. We're gonna we're gonna talk about why I made this image. Who are these people? Um, look at that. Hey! Look at that. Look, look, we did Thank it. Thank you, Matt. We did it. Yeah, Yay, we did it. Thank look you. Look it. We met <laughs> our goal. We did the goal. All right. Um. You yep, need a shot to... thing on the soundboard. Or something. Oh, um, I have. Do you have one? I have one of these. Oh no. Oh. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I got that. Um, so appreciate everyone who helped out with that. Especially Yeti dropped a big, big check on that. So appreciate you, fam. Yeah, shout out um, to our brother Yeti for with a huge donation that he gave yesterday towards the, that. Why we were able to hit it very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank. You. Um, uh, all right. <laughs> So, Last story. As we hold on, bad cookies. It's like I only ask that you destroy any of my personal information. <laughs> I only have like a couple of cookie crumbs left, you know. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, all right. So, again, British spies in Palestine. We got James Bond here with his Aston Martini. Um, you know, you're wondering why I might have this image. Well. Uh, this... Who are these people? Hey, look at that. Another hey, donor from Mastermind Hour with $10. <laughs> Appreciate you, fam. Um, so, leaked docs reveal British intelligence secret exploitation of Palestinian refugees. Check the date on that, Care Bear. That's what, May 15th? Okay. So, a minute ago, right? Not many people talked about this, right? So... Luckily, we're 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 gonna get to that. So, Cook Clarenberg writes: leaked files obtained by Mint Press News detailed the intensive interest taking Palestinians both within and without the country by British intelligence operatives and Foreign Office funded and directed cutouts over many years. Collectively, the material leaves little room for doubt that the British government has long sought to covertly surveil, infiltrate, and manipulate Palestinians from malign ends while exploiting their suffering to serve London's geopolitical objectives. And I doubt it's just London. But that's what we're focused on today. Um, so, throughout the Syrian proxy conflict, British intelligence ran expensive psychological warfare programs targeting the local population and Western citizens. The objective was to destabilize Bashir Assad's government and convince domestic and foreign audiences, including overseas governments, internal bodies that the western backed free syrian army was a moderate legitimate alternative and flood media globally with pro-opposition propaganda a corrupt constellation of private contractors staffed by british military veterans and former spies delivered three clandestine campaigns and shout out to nessa and gray zone and all the people that exposed that when it was happening um so Innovative communications and strategies, aka Incostrat, was a particularly prolific participation in this effort. The firm was funded by Paul Tilley, Britain's former Minister of Defense, head of communications for West Asia, and Emma Winberg, a longtime MI6 officer who subsequently married now deceased White Helmets founder James Leshmushu. The leaked documents reveal that in Syria, she was tasked with the management and development of a local network of interlocutors, key leaders, and local coordinators. So try to keep those names in your brain as we continue. So this is what they wrote in the leaked documents. So the network is able to assist in the development of messages and influence through word of mouth in difficult to reach areas. The knowledge gained through these interactions will generate a contextual understanding that provides the foundation for our communication campaigns, our ability to assess their efforts and to provide detailed atmospheric reports that inform HMG of the developing situation in Syria. Right? So, Winberg is described as Britain's lead on engagement with the Syrian army opposition in Istanbul while serving as a foreign office political military officer in Turkey from 2013 onwards. 
she cultivated an extensive range of contacts in North and East Syria, meaning she was trusted and respected by moderating op opposition leadership figures. This may account for why Infostrat av avidly maintained a perfect record of safety and security for its staff in the country, even while the company secretly operated in areas under ISIS control. What do we know about that, Colin? What do we know about that? Um, Winberg harvested so much crucial intelligence in this role that her resultant insights represented a core contribution to British, European, and U.S. understanding. Keep in mind, we share intelligence, right? Thanks to thanks to the war on Turk, we now we now share all this info with them, right? So, <clears throat> um. An assessment of armed groups in Syria, intriguingly, she was transferred to Istanbul directly from the British consulate in Jerusalem, a vital regional base of operations for MI6. While there, she reported on violent extremist organizations active in Gaza, including during Operation Cloud Pillar in 2012, for which she was commended internally. Cloud Pillar saw Israeli occupation <coughs> forces massacre almost 200 Palestinian civilians after assassinating high-ranking Hamas leader Ahmad Jabari. This was keeping with MI6's strategy to degrade the capabilities of rejectionists of the pro-Zionist Palestine Authority. When was this, Care Bear? 200 Palestinian civilians dead? November 2012? Yep. I, but I, Colin, I thought it all started on October 7th. I thought, I thought, thought that happened. Um, so this was in keeping with MI6 strategy to degrade, right. So Winberg's close range view of these events made her a compelling candidate for overseeing London's contribution to the proxy war from the perspective of her employers and British intelligence. Moreover, she was not alone in Infostrat operatives and secretly surveilling Palestinians firsthand. Right. So one company staffer managed a twenty five million dollar small grants program to directly support community stabilization, engage youth and moderate actors in the Palestinian territory. U.S. control intelligence cut out USAID 2005 to 2007. This placed I, them on the front line of the Zionist entity's embarrassing defeat by Lebanon Hezbollah in the summer of 2006 and concurrent military incursion. In Gaza. Along the way, they reported on the political, economic, and security situation locally, including extensive reporting during internal instability in Gaza. Meanwhile, another Infostrat operative CV boasts that they traveled and studied in Israel and Palestine, focusing on religious political movements, then studied Palestinian refugees in Syria before the uprising. After that, they worked with and trained Syrian activists in several organizations. In a supremely striking feature that multiple Incostrat operatives went straight from intently studying, quote, Palestinian refugees and armed groups to cloak and dagger movements of the moderate Syrian opposition. In this context, what are we to make of the fact that British intelligence cutouts have for many years been heavily active in Lebanon's Palestinian refugee camp? Around 300,000 Palestinian refugees inhabit Lebanon, roughly half of them in camps administered by the United Nations Relief and Works Unruh. Living conditions are appalling, with overcrowding, poverty, and rampant unemployment. Discrimination towards Palestinian refugees at both a public and state level is commonplace. This intensified significantly due to untold numbers of displaced people. Among them, many Palestinians pouring into Lebanon from neighboring Syria as a result of the grinding 11 year Western proxy war against Damascus. Such a milieu inevitably produces a wider range of grievances among refugees, which can be malignly exploited by British intelligence. Since 2009, Foreign Officer Office Contractor ARC, founded and run by MI6 operatives Alistair Harris, operated in Lebanon's 12 Palestinian refugee camps and linked files the company boasts of its granular understanding of the camps, internal, political, economic, ideological, religious, and everyday dynamics 
Arts' voluminous local contracts have access throughout all camps and gatherings. This means that community-level discussions and activities of all revenants can be influenced and spied upon as required. So keep this arc in your head as well. Um, such everyday real-life insight is augmented by daily monitoring of neighborhood-level WhatsApp groups. What, what are we talking about, Colin, when we, when we talk about the doctors in Gaza story? What did he... What did he say was happening to the tent cities outside the hospital? You remember? Oh. Well, besides just what I remember specifically was just like the stench, like mm -hmm. people just kind of crowded in tight quarters. Yep. Um, that's what I remember vividly from that article. So it also mentioned in that article that uh, the tents had numbers assigned to them and that there were WhatsApp right. groups that were like monitoring all the information of those tents for, you right. know, helping refugee purposes. So it's, so, so it's essentially doing what um, the Gaza Health Ministry was doing. Yes. Before every hospital has basically been destroyed, so they have no way of. So, the so the people are doing it this way, a little more bare bones, but they're kind of taking on that. But job, they're using WhatsApp groups, right, to do so. Right. So, which this is telling us, such everyday real life insight is augmented by daily monitoring of neighborhood level WhatsApp groups. Right. So they're spying on those. Meanwhile, local engagement with a social media platform created by Art called Nastopia is heavily monitored. The page run by a 24-strong team of Art trained youth reporters is intended to increase demand for community engagement and improve conditions. Among camp residents, it promotes covertly foreign office finance projects in camps as success stories. We're serving as a forum for online and offline discussion about social injustices in virtual space to talk about topics considered taboo in the game. ARC has spearheaded various community initiatives elsewhere in the offline realm. These include repairing and restoring streets and cemeteries, recycling, promoting small businesses, providing welfare to disadvantaged and disabled residents, managing nurseries and daycare centers, and even launching a local coffee shop. The leaked files describe this as a popular place for youth to gather and promote civic engagement in their community and a shared Palestinian identity that bridges factional differences. So, insidious surveillance and manipulation components of these projects aside, one might reasonably argue that given the harsh internal environment of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, any effort to regenerate and improve conditions for residents of all ages create a sense of community is a net positive, yet the ultimate purpose of these projects is to create a secret army of anti-government act activists which can be activated to stir up trouble if and when British intelligence wishes. Of course, the leaked documents do not frame that objective in such terms. One file refers to the value of highlighting success stories in the camp says, enhancing the audience's confidence in their own ability to contribute to social change. Other words, encouraging Palestinian refugee, refugees to take matters into their own hands. This intention is articulated far more emphatically in a leaked March 2019 study conducted by ART. The document identified a segment of Beirut's diverse population that could be united in opposition to Lebanon's government and therefore mobilized to effect positive social change. On their own initiative, the ideal target group was comprised of individuals who disavowed violence, but not other forms of contentious politics and could be influenced to engage in certain behaviors such as protests, leafleting campaigns, and other community initiatives. The analysis explicitly characterized Palestinian refugees as an important part of such an effort. Therefore, ARC pledged to both covertly and overtly promote the message that change is possible and ordinary citizens have a role to play in achieving change. Through propaganda campaigns and civil society initiatives, these would highlight where change has been achieved or where threats to Lebanon's stability are countered, 
In turn, the broader population of Lebanon will be well educated on how barriers to reform can be overcome via direct popular action. Seven months after ARC produced this study, large scale protests engulfed the streets of Beirut. Western media immediately spoke of revolution in the country. Few outlets acknowledged that the unrest had begun in July of that year when thousands of refugees inhabiting several camps commenced mass demonstrations demanding reforms to local employment laws that barred them from numerous professions. Coincidentally, in one leaked argument, Ark boasts of how the company takes pride in ensuring refugees recruited through its illicit schemes receive annual leave, sick leave, and health insurance despite this not being legally necessary due to local legislation discriminating against Palestinians. Lebanon was a critical organization nucleus for the Syrian opposition, which Ark directly and embedded with before the revolution started. The document circulated among anti-Assad elements in Beirut in 2011, secretly intercepted by Syrian security services, set out a blueprint for events to the uprising to date, and precisely that would subsequently transpire in Damascus. The opposition proposed convening mass demonstrations in every major Syrian city, the security forces will lose control of all regions, be taken unaware, and become exhausted and distracted. This, along with honest officers and soldiers joining the ranks of the revolution, would make toppling down the regime straightforward. Any crackdown of these protests were as forecast to precipitate a Western military strike a la Libya, the opposition foresaw major news outlets playing a significant role. The document writes, everyone should be confident that with the continuation of demonstrations today, media channels will have no choice but to cover the events. Al Jazeera will be late due to considerations of media interests, but we have Al Arabia and Western media channels who will come forward. We will all see the change in tone and cover the events and demonstrations that are aired on the channels. They will have wide coverage. The Assad government did not choose to publicly uh, publicize this bombshell file for unclear reasons, it only became publicly available and translated into English through the work of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. The organization was spun out of ARC in May 2011 to prosecute Syrian officials for war crimes. Its first act was to covertly train opposition activists in basic international criminal and humanitarian law in service of a domestic justice process in a future transitional period. As the foreign fomented crisis escalated into an all-out proxy war, CIJA began employing extremist groups to smuggle sensitive documentation out of abandoned government buildings in opposition-occupied areas of Syria, paying these factions, including all news front and ISIS, vast sums for their services, while generating enormous amounts of fawning media coverage. The commission convicted just two Syrian officials of war crimes, only after the pair voluntarily defected and made numerous incriminating statements to their Western handlers. Um, anything to add, Colin? Are you keeping up? Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's... It, I will admit, this. it's a lot. Yeah. Um, but... I don't know. It, it it's well. It just kind of it, it just goes to show how you how imperial. Well, I think we think of America in terms of what's happening in Palestine quite frequently, and given that we live here, it makes the most sense. But you know, but this is not surprising considering. Um, you know, we talked about what happened with Kwame Toure. Like, it has to be over two years ago. I think we did um, a segment on him where essentially, like, he was kind of being targeted, you know, for, for, by the British government in light of, you know, his appeal given the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement and how it was kind of coalescing a lot of those groups. And, like, like the Black communities, like, basically across countries, you know, given what he was saying and, like, how, like, you know, the British, um, I don't want to say they were MI6, but, like, you know, but he was targeted, you know, by the British government in a similar way. 
you know, like as this. So, so this really shouldn't be surprising, you know, all the same, but it's just the idea of, you know, actually having a spy network in connection with this and what's happening in Palestine that is also being kind of infiltrated in this too. Um, yeah. It just kind of shows how deep uh, this really goes in terms of how imperialism is involved in all. Yep. Well, there's only a few more slides, so I'll, I'll finish it up. So this is essentially them talking about um, the failure, of course, attributed to the collapse of the British and U.S. regime change project, right? So that's what this is all around. So, indeed, the success of CIJA's business model was wholly contingent on the violent overthrow of Assad and his government. The fact that the commission was founded before the Syrian Arab army was even formally deployed to Damascus amply demonstrates the CIJA and ARC had substantial grounds to believe that decisive Western intervention would be forthcoming at the earliest stage of the peaceful revolution. Per the intercepted document, so too did opposition activists in Lebanon in May 2011, the same month CIJA was founded, which of course referenced an ongoing NATO airstrike on Libya. While such intervention didn't arrive as expected, arms and fighters promptly began flowing from Tripoli to Syria. After that, in direct coordination with MI6, many insurgents were former members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, who were freed from prison four years earlier by Gaddafi after an intervention from one of the group's founders, Norman Bentiman. Bentiman claimed to have rejected political violence, embraced pacifism and democracy, and pledged to de-radicalize the jailed LIFG fighters in return for their release. In 2010, he became president of the UK government-funded Quilliam Foundation, the world's first counter-extremism think tank. In this position, he was instrumental in securing high-level defections from Gaddafi's government during the Civil War. The organization avowed contributions to the NATO effort intensified existing suspicions about the special interest it might be serving. After Quilliam shut down in April 2021, veteran journalist Ian Cobain made a startling disclosure. The foundation had been secretly established by the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, OSCT, shadowy British intelligence agents. London spies had initially planned to fund the venture covertly with money appearing to come in from a Middle Eastern benefactor, but channeled by MI6. Instead, overt government financing was granted, a move eventually judged within Whitehall to have been a mistake, an OSCT source lamented. They write, should have run it from within the agency, they do this sort of stuff all the time, and you never find out. So, Palestinian-focused civil society organizations and initiatives are frequently constructed by British intelligence without participants or broader local populations learning the true sponsors and purposes they serve. With Israel openly planning to reconstruct a politically moderate Hamas-free Gaza post-genocide, it is incumbent to reflect on how any proposed replacement leaders will almost inevitably be, one way or another, graduates of MI6 sponsored programs and therefore British assets, whether knowingly or not. That's why I brought the story. So, you know, keep, keep your eyes on a swivel out there, is all I'm saying. You know, yeah. do a little questioning of the systems in place. So, yeah. <laughs> Anything to add? Um, no. Well, talking about these things is why we're demonetized. You can go to kodashv.com slash Indie News Network. Help us out and give us a little donation that way by scanning the QR code on your screen. Put an exclamation mark donate in the chat. If you can't do that, you can always just like and subscribe. Hitting the share button or commenting. That kind of engagement really helps us beat the suppression. We're almost at 2K, so definitely subscribe if you haven't already. But otherwise, thanks for watching.